also launching his book at um, uh, 6 o'clock Heights Books, 48A Florida, along with Brown Busher, who's um, got a book about neoliberalizing nature and conservation. Lorenzo, people have seen the advertisement, they know you're from Kentucky's, and an Italian, and very accomplished, so take it over. Thank you, Patrick. Um, thank you uh, for being here, even though it's lunchtime. And I have to apologize, I have a bit of a cough, so I'm actually need to drink from time to time. But, uh, so, um, my presentation is titled The Dark Side of GDP and Why It Matters for Africa's Future. And um, it's loosely ba based on the book that I've just published, which is called The Gross Domestic Problem. And I'm actually quite happy to see that more and more people are now using this, uh, this play of words actually to describe GDP. More recently, even Dana Shiva wrote a piece for Yes, in which she is encouraging more and more people to call it the gross domestic problem rather than, rather than uh, the, GDP, the gross domestic problem. Okay, um, I'm going to try and, and condense this presentation in, 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 in probably 20 or 25 minutes and see how it goes. And then we can have a, we can have a bit of a debate. Um, you know, we're so used to GDP, to what, it to what it measures, that we forget that it's actually a pretty recent invention. And I think Andy Leonard and the story of stuff gives us a bit of a, uh, a glimpse of what was the, the, the period of time in which this, uh, the, the way in which we measure economic success, success uh, was introduced. And so let me give you the amazing but short life of GDP in four different phases. Well, the first phase was the 1930s. At the time, there was the Great Depression and countries and governments were scrambling desperately to get a to get a way of to find a way of monitoring basically whether their policies to kickstart the economies out of the recession were working or not. Very simple, as simple as that. At that time, even in the US, they didn't really know whether the economy was actually producing a certain amount of output or not. They had simply uh, very sketchy statistics about, you know, like freight loads and transportation costs and so on and so forth. They didn't have a bigger picture. So that's when a guy called Simon Kuznets the time it was about my age, it was working for the National Bureau for Economic Research, leading think tank, economic think tank in the world. And he had a very simple idea, you know, like come up with a number that would condense in one figure all the amount of consumption um, of, of, a, of, a given economy, of a given economy. Okay, and it's actually, this was, this were the 1930s, and it was so persuasive that in 1937, the US Congress gave him the, the, the mandate to set up the first national income accounts. That's a broad-based survey upon which GDP is based. Um, those were the 1930s. A few years later, what happens? There is a big you know, shift in, the, in, in world politics called the Second World War. And actually, Kuznet's work became extremely useful for US involvement in the war in, in the Second World War. And that's why Kuznets was invited by President Roosevelt. So you get this statistician that knows very little about armaments and war strategy to be part of the war production board. This was the, the, the team of experts that would, allow, would advise the president on how to strategize the American involvement in the Second World War. And he basically said that GDP could actually be used to plan for the war. Use, you know, like to coordinate the transformation of the American economy from a civilian economy to war economy without hurting internal consumption. And he did a, 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 a very, very successful job at actually providing the different statistics and the measures that governments then used, even overriding the, the will of the military and some of the commanders of the of US military by using the statistics to basically plan the conversion of the American economy to war economy. And <coughs> a few years later, historians actually comparing the, the state of the American economy during the world to the one of Nazi Germany actually argued that it is true that Hitler was defeated on, on militarily. But actually, had he not been defeated militarily, probably would have been defeated economically. Because Germany had a type of economic expansion during the war that was fundamentally unsustainable. By stifling internal consumption and forcing everybody to actually work for the government. On the contrary, the American economy, because of the statistics produced by Kuznets and his students, was able to actually um, support economic expansion without stifling internal consumption, which was fundamental to actually keep you know, the tax revenues on 
uh, keep them going. And then pent up consumer demand with a significant amount of in industrial, uh, in in intact industrial sector, explain why at the end of the war, America didn't fall into a recession, which is what happened with all the other countries involved in the war, but actually expanded exponentially in a few years. And this is why economists, this is not usually told to students of economics, but economists consider the invention of GDP as important for America as the invention of the nuclear war, the nuclear weapon, the nuclear bomb. Uh, it was as important for America to win the war as the Manhattan Project. And that's the end of the second, the first phase. The second phase begins with the Cold War. At that time, you know, the world was divided, divided into two blocks. On the one hand, you had the Soviets with different type of economy, command economy, different ways of measuring economic performance. They didn't have GDP. And then you had the capitalist economy based, you know, like led by the United, United States that was shaped around the GDP, the GDP account. So these two ways, these two blocks were competing for global supremacy. And actually these two blocks, one way of competing with one another, with one another was to show which development model, economic model, was more successful. Which one was building the best economy in the world? That was as important as the armaments race, for instance. You know, they'll just show what type of power was achieving, the, the, was achieving the best results. And GDP became a fundamental weapon in this rivalry between the two blocks. This is why, you know, the CIA became actually the global expert on measuring economic performance in the Soviet Union. You would expect secret agents to be people with, that are good at martial arts and good at handling guns. But at that time, the CIA's biggest office was manned by statisticians. Their job was simply to dissect each and every report coming out of the Soviet Union to show the rest of the world that it was uh, basically unrealistic and based on flawed statistics by comparing the way in which the Soviets were measuring themselves with the way in which GDP would be measuring them. And by doing this, they discredited 30 years of e alleged economic expansion in the, in the Soviet Union and showing actually that it was mainly based on statistical manipulation or you know, like mismeasurement of certain ways in which the economy was performing in the Soviet Union. And this went on for 30 years until May 1989, which is when the Soviets surrendered, agreed that actually they were not really as sophisticated in measuring their own economy and reached out to the Americans. To teach, to, for them to teach the Soviets how to measure GDP, how to measure the economy in terms of GDP. This was May 1989. The CIA organized a secret meeting between statisticians in Virginia. A few months later, you know, it's history, the Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet Union collapsed, and the new leadership embraced cheerfully both the GDP measure and the market economy. That's the end of the second phase. The third phase is the way, the phase in which GDP became the be-all and all statistic to measure economic performance around the world. Imagine that until 1991, only a few handful of countries around the world were actually measured GDP. Most of the continent where we're sitting now did not have the resources to measure GDP. And actually, even nowadays, most of the GDP statistics com statistic coming out of the statistical offices of many African countries are flawed, imperfect, uh, limited, and so on and so forth, because of the manpower. Because, you know, it takes time and a lot of resources to measure GDP. So, ever since 1991, a bunch of international organizations, including um, the European Union, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank, set out on a journey to teach the world how to measure GDP. And this wasn't just a statistical training camp. It was fundamental because GDP came to be, A, the metric uh, through which countries could qualify for development aid. When you qualify for development, how much development, and when you do not qualify for development anymore, it's based on GDP. And also, it, it had become the metric uh, that governments would use to, to decide whether policies were working or not. They had to push GDP up. So ever since 1991, a bunch of development projects led by these organizations, including actually UNDP, development aid was spent on training statisticians around the world as to how to measure GDP. And if you think about the big government, governance clubs around the world nowadays. GDP is not just a number. GDP can also tell you whether you qualify to be important in global politics. The G8 is basically the seven biggest economies measured in terms of GDP plus Russia. The G20 is exactly the same with the fastest emerging economies, again, measured in GDP terms. GDP is like a certification. You're part of those who matter. 
If your GDP goes down, think, you know, like BRICS. BRICS was invented by Goldman Sachs in 2001. And it was the fastest growing economies in the world that would have overtaken the G8 by 2027. Brazil, Russia, India, and China, South Africa, as you know, was at later as the largest economy in Africa. However, the, you know, the position of South Africa as the largest economy in Africa is currently being challenged by Nigeria revising its GDP statistics as of next year. Nigeria may become actually the largest economy in the continent. And a lot of people in South Africa are scared among the policy community because that may mean that Nigerians will want to take you know, South Africa, the South Africa seat at the G20 or the BRICS as the true representative of the up and coming of African America. In 1999, the U.S. Department of Commerce, which is in charge of GDP statistics, declared officially GDP the greatest invention of the 20th century. And this, you know, sort of ends the third phase of the history of GDP. The fourth phase is the one in which we're living now, in which increasing concerns regarding climate change, CO2 emissions due to industrial production of the GDP-based development model, you know, the costs of pollution that are not feature into including incorporating the prices we pay <coughs> for consumer goods, and also the social impacts of a certain GDP-inspired development model have become extremely important across the world, that, as we heard today, not just in the developed or in the so-called developed or industrialized world, but also in, in some of the so-called developing or less industrialized economies. At the same time, this is also the phase in which the financial crash of 2008, the ensuing Great Recession ever since, has made a lot of people say, well, this is, maybe GDP is fine, maybe there are problems with GDP, but this is not a time to discuss GDP. All we need to do is to get the economies back on track, have them produce, have them, you know, get people to work, and then only when things are up and running again, perhaps we can give ourselves the luxury of rediscussing the way in which we actually measure economic success. And some politicians played within this ambivalence ever since 2007. The first one was the former president of France, Nicolas Sarkozy, that set up a commission in 2007, had by uh, two Nobel Prize winners, Joe Stiglitz and Martin Hussain, on rethinking GDP in France. That was probably the most high profile and most important high profile moment in which economists, social scientists came together to say, well, there's a problem here, we need to do something. He was followed by David Cameron, and as of 2010, asked the National Statistical Office in the UK to actually incorporate questions on perceived well-being in the national statistics vis-a-vis -vis the economic uh, statistics. Then followed by Barack Obama, that set up a commission headed by uh, the Nobel laureate economist Daniel Cannon <coughs> on subjective well-being. And then in 2012, last year, April, the Secretary General of the UN actually went on the record saying that GDP has fundamentally betrayed us. And what we need is a new type of measure that is able to marry the economic, the social, and the environmental well-being. And he called this new ideal measure, gross global happiness. And this is the end of the history of GDP, as I've discussed. But like, let me ask you something. Who knows what GDP actually is? What it measures, except Patrick. <laughs> <coughs> yes. It's the value of all the goods and services in the economy. Good, very good. <coughs> it's an aggregate measure of goods and services consumed, produced, depending on how you look at it within the economy. But it's basically represented by this, this equation. GDP is the consumption plus the investment plus the government spending within an economy plus the exports, so what we sell abroad, minus what we import from abroad, okay? Um, so it means that it's based on money, so it's actually a measure of flows, it's a measure of money. And how you measure money, you measure money in terms of prices. Now remember what Annie Leonard said in the movie, prices are not telling us actually how much things cost, especially in a complex economy like the one in which we're operating, in which there are a lot of externalized costs. Now, what it means that, what does it mean that GDP is based on prices? Let me give you a few examples. Okay, imagine me. I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a young father, and I have two options, right? You know, I can come here and uh, leave my son with a babysitter. And if I leave my son with a babysitter and I pay her, I'm supporting GDP. 
If I decide actually to take time off work and spend time with my own kids, do exactly the same, actually even probably better than, than the, than the babysitter can do, because you would argue that it's better to spend time with your own father or mother rather than with somebody who's being paid for that. Uh, actually, it's not helping GDP because there is no transaction involved. I'm doing exactly the same, performing exactly the same role. So a GDP economy encourages me to hire a babysitter and discourages me for actually spending time with my kids. Same can be said about food. I can grow my own food in my own backyard, and I know what I'm eating. Or I can go to the local retail supermarket and buy something that is coming from somewhere else, very far, full of plastic, and so on and so forth. In the first case, I'm not helping the economy grow. In the second case, I, I am a very good citizen because I'm helping my economy you know, come out of the, of the recession. Or I can take a walk in the park or by the beach here at Durban. And actually, for as long as I don't spend any money buying balloons or ice creams or anything, simply enjoying the beauty of the surroundings, I'm not helping GDP. But if I get my South Africans would understand what I'm talking about, my gas gasoline SUV, going on a safari, you know, buying a lot of booze, trashing the booze out of the, the, booze out of the window so that somebody will need to be paid to go and collect it, then I'm really a good GDP here. Um, whatever is news gets counted in GDP. What is well, sorry, but it's new. What is used doesn't get counted in GDP because it was counted only once when it was new. So as Andy Lander said, a GDP economy is based not on reusing because reusing never features in the calculation, doesn't show in our statistics. We are encouraged to buy a new. And, and, and also what is free doesn't get counted, even though it has an impact on our economic performance. You know, like if you have a good weather, that means good harvest, good crops, good economic growth. If you have a bad weather, it may be the opposite. But never, that never, that never is that, is that feature in how we measure our own economic performance. And what is the freest thing you can think of? Air. Air. So it's mother nature. Yeah. You know? Well, if you look at this graph, this is a very simple um, you know, like a description of two different trends. The downward glider curve is our, the biocapacity of the plant from the 60s onward. We have reduced the biocapacity of our planet. The resources that our planet makes available for us to live are less now than they were in the 60s. At the same time, very same period of time, our GDP growth, the dark gray line, has gone up almost for the same amount. You know, on one hand you have biocapacity, on the other one you have trillions of dollars and billions of dollars <coughs> of, of GDP growth. So nature gets discounted in the GDP accounts twice. Whatever nature contributes to our economic growth, I mean, as for instance, in terms of pollination, air, water, rainfall, all of these things. I mean, if we were to grow our economies without, natural, without the natural help of the planet, we would be impossible. So our economies are only able to produce because they are embedded in a, in a natural ecosystem, which is producing a lot of things that make all the things possible, the wood that is here, you know, the, the, the rainfall that makes our crops grow, and so on and so forth. All that contribution, that is a fundamental contribution, is never counted in GDP. Nor is what comes out of the production process, all the pollution, the, the environmental degradation, and so on and so forth, it's also having an impact. So nature is slapped twice, when it gives us something, and when it actually becomes our dust bin. Um, this is why I would try to call GDP the global debt-based Ponzi scheme, which I think is a much better way of describing GDP than gross domestic product. Do you know what a Ponzi scheme is? I think by now most of you know what a Ponzi scheme is. Bernie Madoff, you know, you give me money, I, I, you give me one million, I give you 10,000 every month, you think you're making money because you think it's actually I'm investing your money, but I'm simply giving you the money back. And for as long as somebody is believing in the system and gives me more money, I'm very mad at it. I'm giving you your money back and running away with the rest of the cash. And you think you're making, you're making money out of the investment, but it's actually getting your money back in small installments until the money runs dry and it's gone. That's what, why Bernie Madoff was convicted to a life sentence and Ponzi, Frank Ponzi, the first time in the 1920s was the one that you know, made it you know, well known, the system whereby you simply give me your money, I tell you I invest it, and then I give you the money back every month. You think, oh, I'm so rich because this is the money I'm getting back, but actually you're getting your own money back until I run off with the cash. Well, and this is what GDP is doing for economics as well. Let's compare GDP to how the um, housing bubble in the US started and how it exploded, okay? 
You know what happened in the U.S. in 2007, okay? There were people that had a house. This house should be treated as capital, right? But they were told, no, you can actually turn it into disposable income. How do you turn capital into cash? Well, you go to a bank and you take a loan. The loan, you cannot repay, but who cares? You are, for now, you think you're rich because you've got cash. You know you're actually reducing, consuming your house or your capital, but you think you've got cash. So, and now that cash gets sliced and diced in different securities. We call them securitized mortgages, sold to investors all over the world. And for as long as, and then we create wealth. And for as long as there is some idiot out there buying the new mortgages that will go will be used to, pay, to repay the previous ones, the system can go on and on and on. If we're all stupid enough to keep investing our money to something that is has a big hole, we can go on and on and on because the new money will be used to you know to, to repay the old the old guys. Then when somebody says I'm not going to invest anymore, the whole system collapses because there's no money then to pay debt of those that can't afford. Now this is how what happened in 2007. When somebody said I'm not going to pay more, the whole system collapsed. Well, GDP works more or less the same way. Instead of a house, we have got modern nature. She's providing us with resources every single day for free. We, through a number of extractive practices, we turn those resources into something we call money. And we add it up to measure GDP. And then we get an illusion that by, man, by that the sort of process that Annie Lenner described in her movie, we are creating wealth. And we call it economic growth. We call it economic miracle. We call it development. This system can go on and on for as long as modern nature gives us those resources at a faster rate than we deplete them. Some of them can be replenished, and modern nature does that all the time. Some others cannot and will run out at some stage. Some of them already run out. And then we move on to other you know, like areas of extraction. There's also another element of the history of GDP that I call the Frankenstein Center. Do you know the story of Frankenstein, right? There are two main characters. One is Dr. Frankenstein, in this case is Simon Kuznets, the guy that invented GDP, and the other one is the creature, the monster, Frank, the, the, the monster that we call GDP. Well, if you go back, as I've done for my book, to what Mr. Kuznets said at the very beginning, when he started putting together the statistics that would be known later on as GDP, he had already understood all the problems of his own measurement, and he warned his own fellows and the next generations against using his own indicator. He said, first of all, look, GDP is an aggregation of consumption, which means that you may have an economy in which a few people are earning a lot of money or consuming a lot of money, and the vast majority is in, is in, in poverty, in extreme poverty. And still GDP, because it's an average, will tell you the economy is doing fine. This is what, ha what happens you know, like in a country like South Africa, for instance, in which all consumption is aggregated at the top level, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an increase of luxury at the top, and they offset poverty at the bottom. So you don't get a sense of what's happening. You say economists would tell you that if you have your hat in the microwave and your feet in the freezer, on average, you're doing fine. You know, like, but that is, a, that is not always you know, a lot true. Secondly, it said something really important. It said, look, GDP, as I said, is based on market transactions. It's based, you know, on, on, on um, formal transactions. If I raise my own food, or if I sell, if I pick up my food to my neighbors, that doesn't count for GDP because there's no price tag attached to it. So GDP does not measure all the things that we do for one another informally that actually have a significant impact. Now imagine that the IMF says that in a country like South Africa, roughly a third of our economy is happening in formal. These are street vendors, these are people that exchange uh, commodities and goods in villages and so on and so forth. None of this is counted as part of GDP. What happens is that when your policymakers use GDP to devise policies, they will encourage a form of consumption that destroys the informal economy to be replaced with a formal economy. This is what happens, for instance, you know, in Johannesburg when you have a street market that is banned to make space for a shopping mall. That's exactly what is happening. The, the city says, you know, we need to sustain economic growth. These people here do not count because they're, they're not measured. What they're doing is irrelevant. 
we need to replace them with real economic growth, GDP-based, which is the shopping mall. Price tags, slips, and so on and so forth. So there is a, he said, in 1937, he said, let's not use ever GDP in informal economies because it's going to give us a skewed understanding of economic development. And yet it wasn't listened to. He said, look, prices are arbitrary measures, just like what Annie Leonard said. It's the only measure I could find, but we shouldn't actually believe in prices too much as good measures of economic value. He said also something really important, that he lived during the Second World War, and at that time, the military victory against Germany was <coughs> as important, as he said, as the welfare of a nation. But he said, but we should never, ever allow military expenses to be included in GDP, which is what happens nowadays, because these are regrettables. He said, these are things that we shouldn't want. So if you measure them, and if you consider them to be part of economic success, governments will spend more and more in the military in order to show that they're doing fine, which is what has happened all uh, ever since. America's GDP growth in most of the 60s and the 70s was mainly due to a significant amount of military expenses. And also this applies to many countries, including South Africa nowadays. So he said, you cannot put certain expenses into the pot if these expenses are bad for us. We should actually try and exclude them so that we do not push economic growth up by you know, creating conditions that make us less secure. He also said, hey, hold on. We also have to consider that it's not always good to increase income. There are reverse sides of income. Income can come with increasing insecurity, can come with a number of issues, more time spent at work. So if you have a policymaker that simply wants to push GDP up, that, 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 that growth may actually come with a lot of strings attached that may, may be eventually negative for society. And he also said defensive consumption. He mentioned this very interesting thing. He said, hold on, GDP doesn't tell us if people are simply consuming to protect themselves against the GDP growth process. This is what some economists call the air conditioning syndrome. You know the air conditioner? You know, it's hot. I think in Durban we use a lot of air conditioning, air conditioning here. You know, it's hot, your neighbor goes and buys an air conditioner. So his room is cooler now, but he's emitting heat against your own window. So what do you do to protect yourself against that type of consumption? You go and buy air conditioning yourself. So you're creating a vicious circle of consumption that is only meant to protect yourself against the consumption of your neighbors. And it's also said, no policymaker should ever look at the quantity of growth. Policymakers should look at the quality of growth. What do you want to grow? Which sectors do you want to grow? And which sectors you shouldn't grow? Because they're not good for the economy or for society. He distinguished between the two. Something that you have never heard probably from a politician. He seems to say <coughs> GDP has to go up, it's a good thing, GDP goes down. Or from journalists. Have you ever heard the journalist asking the politician whether GDP growth was a good thing for the country or not? It's usually considered to be the most important thing. And finally, he said, each generation should be allowed to discuss what is included in the number and what is excluded. He said, I invented GDP in 1937. What I, what I thought was right or wrong may not be the same as what people will think in 1960s, 1970s. So each generation should be allowed to say, this has to be included, this has to be excluded. Of course, it wasn't listened to. And GDP was so successful at, at helping America win the war that you know, policymakers have seen also in the, in the story of stuff, simply believed, you know, this consumption-based model is the way to go. We'll make America strong and we'll convince the rest of the world that this is where we should go. And the new foot soldiers of this type of model became the consumers. Um, as you know, you know, like Benjamin Israeli once said, you know, there are three types of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. And I think, you know, the culprit here is a very well-known person in South Africa, Mr. Price. We know that prices can be very easily, as it can be affected by monopolies. So, you know, there could be a monopoly affecting price, and that is not a good proxy of the value of the goods or services we're buying, right? So, the whole idea of what economists call marginal utility, what is increased by us consuming or purchasing goods, may not be reflected in the price at all, because the price has been agreed by between the two of us, you know? So, in the country, imagine, you know, imagine, you know, for instance, subsidies, how they affect. Prices. In some countries, subsidies can push up GDP in certain areas, and in some countries, it could do exactly the opposite. Lobbying. You know, some prices may be higher just because those who lobby have closer connections to government than those who do not have the same. 
Technological innovation is also having an impact on, on, on the way in which prices perform. You know very well that nowadays you can buy a laptop, which is, in absolute terms, cheaper than the one you bought 10 years ago. In absolute terms. And in terms of capacity, it's probably a thousand times better. So if GDP was measuring prices, it would go down every time there is a technological innovation. So the, the statisticians manipulate the prices. They create what they call deflators, GDP deflators or idiotic models. They try to measure, with a lot of imputation, try to measure the added value of a, of a cheaper thing to our own wealthy. So even then, even in the GDP statistics, prices are manipulated all the time. And then, as I said, the question of government expenditures. How do you, how can you believe that what the government spends, the arms deal in South Africa, was really a good indication of the marginal utility increase that that type of purchase you know, had for the poor South African citizens? Because it was a flawed deal. Often what government buys is not available in the market. So that creates a condition whereby prices are fundamentally hijacked by different, different dimensions. And then, um, <coughs> Patrick mentioned it today, in the type of economy we have, GDP is gross domestic product, which means it only measures what's consumed and spent within the national borders of a country. Now, but imagine, you know, like how much of the stuff we actually consume in the, in the, in the North, in Europe, or in the US, is produced in China. Okay? That adds to the Chinese GDP, but it's actually stuff and money that doesn't stay there. It's produced and it's used for consumption in another part of the world. Foreign direct investment, which means basically companies coming here, producing here, but often bringing profits elsewhere, is also, you know, like skewing our GDP statistics. There is evidence that some of the miracle in the 90s, of the Asian miracle, was mainly due to statistical accounting. The fact that a lot of companies started producing in China pushed up the Chinese GDP, but actually that money didn't stay in China that went back to Europe anyway. It was just because it was counted as Chinese GDP that changed. So, like, and even imagine, imagine different production processes. Imagine this, 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 I, I bought it, I don't know, probably bought it in Woolies, it was made in South Africa, but let's pretend it was made in China. It would probably, it would probably, you know, I bought it for $20. Probably it was made in China, and it cost $5 to the company, to Woolies, that bought it from the Chinese subsidiary, right? So $5 is produced entirely in China, bought for $5, and brought to South Africa. So $5 are added to the Chinese GDP. Then it comes to South Africa, and it's sold for $20. There's no added value. It adds $15 to the South African GDP. But it was entirely produced in China. So even the way in which our economy operates makes us unable to use GDP as a good proxy of real added value. Because where the value is added, often is where it's not counted. Uh, uh, today, Patrick mentioned the Africa rising, the African miracle, and so on and so forth. You probably you know, have seen The Economist and all this talk about Africa being the new, you know, the new best, you know, like um, child in the block, and so on and so forth. So, and you know that this is based only on GDP. It's based on what we know about GDP, right? So you've seen. Let me tell you a tale of two curves. Okay, this is the first curve. And it's an upward curve. It's green, it's beautiful, and everybody's excited about it. And it's GDP growth. South Africa, 2.6%, not so good, but Equatorial Guinea, 5.7%. This is 2012. Angola, 6.8%. DRC, 7.1%. Chad, 7.3%. Niger, 14.5%. And you know what is the fastest growing economy in, South Af in Africa? It was in 2012. I guess, I accept guesses also from Africa. Which one is it? Libya, 129%. Why, when you've got nothing, you know, whatever you do is already growing. I mean, if you have one brick left and you build another one, it's already 100% growth. So this is why, this is the type of Africa rising we're seeing, you know, like high growth rates in many African countries, not all of them. But if, instead of GDP, we use another debatable, but I wouldn't get into that debate here, indicator is the adjusted net savings of the World Bank. As, here's another tale, and it's a downward curve. Republic of South Africa, 3.4% minus negative 2012. This is measuring 
the economic costs of a set of environmental, let's say, very, you know, like, you basically subtracting from GDP, what are the economic costs of certain environmental uh, issues, okay? In the, you know, like soil erosion and a, few, and a few others, okay? It's a very imperfect system. It takes a long time to be measured and so on and so forth. But it gives us an idea of the real amount of savings, so what you're actually using for the future. And also, as Patrick already mentioned, has, you know, like, puts together different types of capital. But let's say it gives us an idea of whether your country is really doing better or, or not. Equatorial Guinea, minus 38.45%. Angola, minus 42.63%. Chad, minus 49. And the DRC, minus 57. So it's actually all these countries, when you subtract the environmental costs of development, are actually becoming poorer than GDP shows. So, as he said, they may very well stay, stand still and stay in bed rather than work and do anything because they're losing out of this process rather than, rather than adding to it. And this is the tip of the iceberg uh, sort of approach to GDP. As I've said, GDP is measuring what the formal economy flows within the formal economy. Yet, in, 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 in the majority of countries around the world, most of our economies are informal, which means that they're not captured by GDP, but they're destroyed by policies designed to support GDP. As I said, replace a bully market or a vendor market with a shopping mall. It's exactly what is happening in Germany every second month. And it's exactly what is leading a lot of people into poverty. By destroying, by limiting access to, to, to the, um, common resources, and by, this, by limiting their, cap their capacity to trade in informal, in informal, through informal channels. And replacing it with formal uh, trade institutions. Which means that GDP, by increasing GDP, which is, could be considered the tip of the iceberg, the bigger part of the iceberg, the rest of Africa, is actually being shrunk, being reduced and increased as we go over. In order to keep the GDP system afloat, which is only, as I've said, at best, 50% of our real economies. Have you heard about the Chinese miracle? That's another thing. After Africa rising, everybody's fond of China. You know, fond of China these days. And it's, 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 it's a great miracle. I mean, like, it's, we all know that China has some of the most incredible, uh, you know, like, um, infrastructure in the world nowadays and so on and so forth. But there's another side of this miracle, which is this. You know, the crazy amount of pollution in, the, in China's biggest cities. Uh, this is a picture taken in Beijing, but it's a daily occurrence in most uh, Chinese cities these days. You know that um, China has the fastest train in the world. If you can see it, because actually through the amount of smog, often you can hardly see the, you know, the, the, the railway and even the new uh, developments that have some of the most luxurious and beautiful skyscrapers are a little visible through the pollution, especially in Beijing. This is a picture taken from NASA that is describing man-made pollution in mainland, mainland China as seen from the satellite. And you see the gray area here. <coughs> And here is a study just published by The Lancet, it's on 2012 data, it says 1.2 million people die in China every year for pollution-related causes. And here is a, is, a, is a headline from the Financial Times, have you heard of air apocalypse? People leaving China, especially expats, because it's no longer uh, pleasant to live in these cities. And an interview I had with Pan Yue, the former Deputy Minister of the Environment in China, he said this miracle, what we call the miracle, will end soon because the environment can no longer keep pace. Environmental damage has cost China 8 to 15 percent of GDP per year of the entire GDP without considering the depletion of resources. Our country has almost lost everything it has gained since the late 1970s due to pollution. Now, Pan Yue was the guy that, it, that introduced in 2006 the green GDP, the first country in the world to introduce a green GDP, so GDP that would also calculate the environmental costs of the kind of growth, was China. Two years down the line, the whole exercise was shut down for a simple reason. It revealed that the best performing provinces in, in, the, in, in the country were also the most polluting one. And when you added the cost of pollution to economic growth, and when you would take it out of GDP, they became negative. So the best miracles in the country were actually making the country poor. This was unpalatable to politicians, and the whole thing was shut down. But you know, what is um, the, the most polluted city in the world? Patrick 
that you're not allowed to say anything. Yes. Sasselberg. It's not Beijing. It's actually, it's actually, yeah, it's actually in Pumalanga. It's actually a uh, web bank, and 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 so uh, you call it now a uh, Emalaki. Exactly. So this is according to air pollution statistics, the most polluted city in the world. And it's because of coal-fired plants. Uh, so the Chinese miracle is actually catching up quite quickly with South Africa and the rest of Africa. The good part of the story is, ever since the mid-2000s, the amount, the number of those that criticize GDP and the way in which it has misled our policymakers has been growing. You can, you know, some of them used to be worshippers of GDP up until a few years ago, but it's never too late to change your mind. Some of them can be divided into reformists and more radical, you know, groups. The reformists nowadays include the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the European Union, and even the World Bank are among those saying we have to actually move beyond GDP. The United Nations has for many years developed alternative indicators, and it has argued that actually now more recently an inclusive wealth index that is trying to measure the uh, impact of, so of human produced and natural capital on economic growth. Some of them have in, you know, suggested the inclusion of a variety of indicators, like do away with one indicator and try and measure more things, which would they call the dashboards. We have examples of green GDP from different countries around the world. China, as I said, was the first one. And then in Rio Plus 20, they introduced the idea of GDP plus, so like taking out the environmental costs of GDP and uh, deducting them from GDP as a way of measuring sustainability. Some other groups believe that GDP should be replaced altogether. And these are those that, you know, like that have been promoting measures like the genuine progress indicators ever since the 1980s. Um, gross national happiness in Bhutan, you probably have heard about Bhutan, having not measured GDP, measuring something different, which is the way in which their own citizens see the achievement in nine different dimensions. They call it the gross national happiness. These days, it's becoming more and more popular. And then a number of indexes of well-being around the world. There's also another part of the story that I think is good, which is the change from the love. And I think for some of you it may be more interesting than what the statisticians or the economists are trying to do. Nowadays, in many parts of the world, especially in the north, but not just in the north, the so-called global north, whatever that means, you see more and more people that because of peak oil, because of the running out of you know like fossil fuels and energy resources, they're more and more concerned with the type of development model we have built for ourselves. And it's not unusual to hear people talk about degrowth. And I think in one of the slides, Patrick had a couple of banners from the degrowth movement in Europe, including the degrowth conference in Vex last year. <coughs> and um, more and more uh, people are joining something called the transition movement. Uh, started in the UK, spread now to, all, to over 140 countries around the world. These are people that basically try to become prosumers. They refuse the idea of consumerism, of consumption, and they say, let's produce and consume ourselves, for ourselves. Let's try and become as, as resilient as possible, right? not being dependent on formal chains of production and consumption. They organize you know, opportunities for people to trade and barter goods, services, exchange them through time banks or other forms of barter, so in which there is no money involved. You do it for yourself or you do it for your neighbors. Um, they produce their own energy. They're trying to introduce renewables, not just to fight climate change and so on and so forth, but also to make communities more energy resilient. You know, it's a very important topic in South Africa in the age of load shedding here. Most of our households are simply dependent on somebody at ESCOM switching on and off the, the switch. We have no way to survive unless ESCOM, you know, like, lets us survive. And these people are trying to build systems whereby communities control their own energy resources and use their own energy without being de de dependent on a bigger commercial scheme. And here you have pictures from different parts of the world, including South Africa. Um, some of them are also rethinking a very important topic, I think, that is seldom mentioned, the role of money. I mean, as I've said, GDP is based on money. GDP is an indication of how quickly money flows from one hand to the next. It doesn't tell us anything about the quality of the transaction or whether that adds to our well-being or not. And it's based also on a type of, you know, like a type of governance of the money system that we're not in control of. 
So some people, for instance, have introduced what they call alternative currencies within these communities. And some of them, including Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the most widespread alternative currency in the world. Nowadays in Berlin, the city where I live for the past three years, you can buy with Bitcoin, not Euros, and 30% of all shops. You can go there and be part of this network. And the most important thing, you know what? These alternative currencies are debt interest free. They do not, you know, cannot put them in a bank and let them accrue interest. They do not, you know, they do, they do, they do not grow. They simply, you have to use them for exchanges. On the contrary, the type of money system we have, it's based on debt, interest. And that is actually skewing the type of economic model we have, including the fact that we need to keep growing in order to keep up with the, with, with the way in which the money system operates. Sorry? <coughs> yes? Is it legal to use alternative? It is legal. It is legal. Nowadays, this is, uh, they fall within the limbo. Basically, now, for, for the moment, they're treated as the airline's reward programs. It's like having miles with South African Airways. So the central banks treat them as if they were a reward program, like points. You accumulate, and then after you get to a certain point, you can go and get a washing machine for them, right? So they're, they're treated as if they were reward programs, but basically, these are alternative currencies. Now, it's only Germany. I'll show you. Germany has uh, probably, it's not in this slide, but Germany has the widest, largest network of alternative currencies in the world, the country Germany, which is arguably the best economy in the world in uh, many look at many different indicators, and yet people in a functioning economy have decided to build alternative networks. Well, there is a, a, a value of around 60 million euro worth of alternative currencies in Germany. And now this, uh, the Bundesbank, the European Central Bank, the German Central Bank, is trying to find ways to curb this because they're scared in some areas may actually overtake the euro as the main currency. And they, feel, they feel threatened by this. But it's only Germany that is being is being, um, you know, like dealt with in a certain history. This is a quote from the uh, largest network of alternative currencies in the U.S. The founder, Paul Glover, says, national currencies are all crumbling because they are all in debt with nature. Since modern human economies extract from nature faster than they can replenish. Local currencies, by contrast, are capable of reconnecting our economies to our planet. But what I believe all these different groups are trying to do is basically from different angles by rethinking money, rethinking energy, rethinking production and consumption and so on and so forth. What they're trying to do is to help us redesign a different economic model that is not based on GDP growth. An economic model that is based on well-being, that's based on actual, you know, like added value to our social and, 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 and human dimensions without necessarily having to go through the type of economic um, system that is designed by, by GDP growth. And in a way, they're republicizing this. What I, what I found extremely disheartening is that no matter what country you travel to these days, well, for the past decades, whether you were from the left or from the right, everybody agreed that the only the thing we want is economic growth. Nobody questioned what type of growth we are seeing and whether that would be a good thing for society. And these people are trying to republicize GDP to bring it back and say, well, we want to have a say over what type of developmental tra trajectory we are on. So, to conclude, if we see GDP as a circle in which production supports consumption and consumption supports production, this is the ideal golden circle of GDP, we have accepted that taxation that may alter this circle has to be rejected. And how many times do you hear, no more tax on the country, tax breaks for the rich, for the 1%, because otherwise we may hurt GDP. Labor regulations have been rejected often because they may hurt GDP. And unfortunately, even the labor unions have bought into this argument, often believing that you, know, you may need to relinquish to let, you know, let go of certain rights, of certain norms, in order for the economy to grow faster. Because then it would actually trickle down to everybody, would be a good thing for everybody. And finally, of course, environmental regulations have to be avoided. Otherwise, they may, that may hurt GDP. How many times do you hear that in South Africa? We cannot afford to protect the environment. Our economy would suffer otherwise. At the same time, we have agreed that we have accepted that we have to keep subsidizing this system to keep, to keep, you know, to, to, to keep it alive, to, let, to, to, to keep it going. We have accepted that we have to introduce all possible pro-market reforms replacing you know, vendor markets with shopping malls at all times in order to keep the system going and finally to get indebted, either ourselves or indebted in nature 
in order to keep the consumption process going. In the United States, the housing bubble didn't just happen because somebody bought a house that wasn't able to repay. It happened because the system incentivized people to debt themselves. Told them, in order for the economy to keep growing, you have to spend more than you earn. It was a whole system designed to keep indebtedness going. And these people indebted themselves, and as we've seen, we indebt ourselves with nature every day. So we accumulate debt with ourselves, with the next generations, and with the, with the, with the environment every single day. And we do this to keep the system going, otherwise the system wouldn't grow. It's not, a, not at all a perfect system. It's a system that is being subsidized every day. Uh, even though we know that countries that grow generally grow unequal. So there is a clear tendency in industrialized and in less industrialized countries to grow in terms of GDP at the expense of equality. So GDP growth and the growth of the Gini coefficient are highly related to one another. Also, we know that economic growth doesn't do what we are told, that it you know, puts people to work. We have seen a lot of jobless recoveries. We have seen jobless growth in the past 20 years across the world. Our type of economies are not doing, you know, often they say, well, we have to push the GDP because people have to go to work. Well, the data shows us that actually that doesn't happen unless you have other types of correctives. So per se, GDP doesn't put people to work. And even though over the years, those who had the guts to question GDP were ridiculed by their own peers, especially in academia, those ever since the 50s that had the guts to say GDP may be wrong were ridiculed by their own peers, the Larry Summers and the Paul Volcker and the Vendor Nankis of the world. And even though countries like South Africa and most African countries have been treated like this little cat, waiting for Godot, waiting for economic growth, to bring us to a new level of prosperity. We're still waiting, right? I mean, like, how many of you have been told 20, 30 years ago, you have to grow, and then everything will come? And then things didn't come, and they told us, well, you didn't grow enough. You didn't grow fast enough. So you have to try, you know, sort of shifting targets. And in the meantime, many economies around the world that are still poor in GDP terms have already experienced all the side effects of high GDP rates that we only see in industrialized countries. So while, while America and Europe could grow GDP over around the century and only start suffering the consequences in terms of social distress, environmental degradation, after a few decades, now the process is much quicker. So you're still for economy, you're still jobless, and then at the same time, you're already suffering from environmental degradation and so on and so forth. I mean, like I have a piece on the Milling Garden last week comparing Nigeria with South Africa, in which I show how all the talk about Nigeria being the best and fastest economy in the continent is fundamentally blind because it doesn't take into account the real costs of the type of model that Nigeria has adopted to develop for the past few decades. This has turned GDP into a vicious circle. And in, 1980, <coughs> in 1982, the Yale economist Charles Lindner compared the GDP model to a prison. And he said, in the GDP model, markets have become prisons because every time you try and change something, every time you, every time you try and, and, and introduce a reform, the GDP system you know, like punishes you with an automated recoil system by threatening to you know, like retrench people, by threatening to move elsewhere, and so on and so forth. So in the GDP system, your hands are tied. You can't do anything. The system will punish whatever type of reform you try and do. But I believe that, and as he said, in every jail, there are jail breaks. And I believe that all the different people that are trying to change the system, whether they're statisticians, Nobel Prize winners, Patrick Vaughan, myself, all of you guys, trying to rethink this development model, are contributing to the advancement of our societies. It may look like it's just a number, but this is the number that is influencing every single choice we make from the day, from the moment we get out of bed, to the moment we go back to bed every day. Our policymakers are selected and elected based on GDP credentials. We buy stuff based on the GDP model. We have a built-in obsolescence model whereby we replace new, new things without new things. We are no longer capable of buying what we want. We are buying what we're given. So all the system that is based on GDP is fundamentally influencing the way in which our society operates. But where there are jails, there are jail breaks. And I believe that by rethinking GDP, we're also designing <coughs> a different model of society. Thank you so much. This was my presentation. Thank you.